So um, today we're going to look at uh, some uh, maximal uh, mixing rates and maximal enhanced dissipation rates that you can achieve uh, in, in general flows. Uh, something that I didn't do yet is maybe how to get uh, uh, mixing for shear flows first. And I mentioned that this is uh, done one way to do it, at least it's uh, by station phase method. And I don't know, I, I'm always kind of uh, surprised how this is not taught very much. Uh, and so maybe le let's just do it quickly. And uh, you know, we, we will do the proof of mixing. So mixing, uh, I mean that uh, again, if you have uh, uh, V, so uh, proof of mixing. And this, is, this will be relevant. Uh, uh, for general flows as well, okay? So, so remember that we had that gamma of t is like one over t to the one over n uh, for shears uh, with uh, critical points of order n, okay? Which means that the h minus one norm of the solution of transport uh, um, decays like that, OK? So I'm going to look at this, uh, the transport equation by shear flow. <coughs> and I'll just take a partial Fourier transform in x, OK? OK, so that's, uh, that's uh, our uh, transport equation. And so we can just write down the solution. That's it. This we can do, uh, I think. Um, so, so if I want to do <coughs> an h minus one norm of the solution, you see, when I did it for Coet, I could take also Fourier transform in y because uh, if you have y here, it's a derivative in Fourier, right? But uh, in this case, I don't want to do it. But if I want to compute the h uh, minus one norm. I just pair these with an H1 function and uh, do by duality. Okay? So what I have to put is an integral of the type um, e to the minus i k v y t as 0 times some function phi. So this is just an integral in y now. And this function is like H1. Uh, at least in y, okay? It's just a function of y, this one, let's say. But you can see it as some Fourier coefficient of a function of x. <coughs> okay, so what's the idea? How do I gain powers of t? Well, I gain powers of t by some sort of integration by parts, okay? so. I could gain powers of t if I write e to the minus i k v uh, t as uh, the as a derivative of something. So okay. So what do I have to put here? So one over minus i k v prime t. So let me just bring the You see, now I got the power of t out. Uh, v prime here, v prime. OK. By the way, stationary phase uh, is something that tells you the decay of this oscillatory integral, uh, you know, given some properties of, of this. So let's just do it by hand. OK, we have this times f0. So uh, let, let me call uh, maybe this function g. OK, it's some function g of y. 
Okay. So, by the way, notice that if uh, uh, v of y is really y, this is actually the Fourier transform in uh, y of g evaluated at kt, right? And so you know that uh, the Fourier transform decays if the function is regular, and if you're willing to just pay one derivative, then you'll decay like 1 over t. And that's the proof for co another proof for coet. But uh, let's do it in general. So the problem is, now if I have critical points, v prime can be 0, right? So I don't want to do this integration by parts everywhere. I can only do it away from the critical points, right? So now for the argument, I hope the sort of general strategy is clear. Now I'm going to specialize in this case, which v of y is like y to the n. So I have one critical point at 0, OK? at uh, uh, <coughs> And, uh, and let's think just locally, though, OK? Let's not think uh, globally. So maybe the domain is all of R or whatever, but this is sort of an, an asymptotic expansion, so I'm going to just localize around there, if you like. And I can always localize in Y, uh, because uh, every smooth cutoff uh, will just go through the equation in Y, right? So th there is no problem. So, so basically, what I'm going to do is that Instead of doing this, I'm going to write, so it's not really this what I'm going to do, but I'm going to split the integral in two pieces. One piece will be somewhere between epsilon and epsilon, OK, in which I do not integrate by parts, because that's where the derivative uh, has a 0, right? So there, I'm sticking with what I had before. So. OK, g plus, and then I have minus epsilon and epsilon complement of what? Of something that goes like kt y to the n minus 1 uh, d dy e to the minus k v of y t. G. Right. And OK, I'm uh, neglecting the constants that may depend. Uh, that there is a constant that depends on n. I'm going to take absolute value. So I don't care about the i. Uh, I want to just keep the dependence on t, essentially, here. OK, That's, uh, this is just a warm up after a night. So we just take it uh, you know, uh, a little bit. Uh, so what do I do here? Here, uh, all I can say is that uh, you know, the interval is small. Epsilon to be chosen, OK? The interval is small. That's all I'm going to say. So this is something like epsilon, size of the interval times the L infinity norm of g in y, right? <coughs> and notice that this has the right uh, regularity. Because, OK, g is the product of a 0 and, and phi. And in one day, d, I can bound this by h1. h1 is an algebra in 1d. And so I actually can put the product of uh, f0 and phi there, right? So there is no problem. So if we, if we keep, keep going here, this is really uh, f0 and h1. And phi, I guess, uh, uh, the norm of phi in H1 is 1. Okay. Sorry, of phi. So it's a test function. And uh, 1 or less than or equal to 1. Okay, so. <coughs> so do we do we agree with this uh, part here? Yes? OK, the other part, I now integrate by parts in y, OK? So what can happen? OK, the derivative can uh, hit here. It can hit here. And let's say, instead of maybe cutting off uh, so sharply, I just put a smooth cutoff, OK? It, but uh, so here there are boundary terms. Uh, OK, it doesn't really matter how we do it. But what, what we would get is, so let's say that the derivative 
hits this guy here. So if the derivative hits here, I have 1 over y to the n, right? So what's that integrated uh, from? So essentially what I'm going to have to do, let's say, is something like that times uh, g. This is uh, as modulus 1, so I just throw it away. So well, what do I do? <coughs> I put this one in L1, this one in uh, uh, L infinity, for example. And this one in L1, how much is this integral? In, 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 So if I put this in L1, how much is it? So if you don't answer, go get some coffee, come back, and then. Uh, what is the, to integrate that, you get one, uh, epsilon to the n minus uh, one, whatever, that. Right, you just integrate uh, y to the minus n, I think. Uh, something like that times g. In, uh, so this is again. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, for the same reason as there, is like F0 and H1, right? Do we agree or not? Yes? And just trust me, all the other terms are of the same similar order, OK? So they're all coming out like that. So in the end here, I will get 1 over epsilon to the n minus 1. F0 and H1. Okay. Let's say that then k is bigger than or equal to 1, so I sum in k, not, nothing matters. So in the end, what I really get is that F of t and h minus 1 is something like epsilon plus 1 over epsilon to the n minus 1 t, F0 and H1. <coughs> So what is the, now I optimize in epsilon, right? That's the idea. So I make these two things equal. Which tells me that uh, epsilon. So it should say that this g when 1 is divided by epsilon power of minus 1 g and the modulus g. Yeah, but k is greater than or equal to 1. Ah, so okay. I mean, you, it's important to keep the dependence in k. I mean, but uh, you see, I can always rescale time here so that k, this was done maybe yesterday with the, also. so yeah, k is 1 if you like. Uh, it doesn't matter. But, uh, t and k go, go together. So this tells me that uh, epsilon to the n is t, so as 1 over t, so epsilon is and so you see that these two terms are the same as these, and, and you get uh, I mean, this is for t greater than or equal to 1, let's say. So uh, so you get the, then you get the brackets, OK? I guess this should be with brackets. OK, so that's uh, the proof of uh, mixing for sure for us. Okay. If you open Stein's book at page, chapter six, you'll see it. Okay, it's there. <coughs> okay, all right. So now, in general, so what what are the questions that uh, we are doing today? So gen general, uh, maybe general framework. So how fast can u equals gradient perp of some Hamiltonian h mix slash dissipate? OK? The case with uh, shear flows is when h depends on one of the two special variables, right? That's uh, but in general, you can ask this for any Hamiltonian flows. And Tarek has told us how important it is to understand uh, 
these questions, and I agree with him. Uh, so uh, we'll see how the, the framework of shear flows kind of breaks down in, in, in many of these cases. Uh, and uh, that's one question. Uh, now I think about more questions. Maybe you have, uh, you know, very good questions to ask. Um, <coughs> and uh, but uh, so l let me just uh, uh, quote the paper. Uh, that, uh, the paper by Ryan's and Young from '83. Okay. And uh, so. It says something like this, so that homogenization uh, within closed streamlines occurs in two stages. So the first stage is a rapid phase um, by shearing. At, uh, that requires a time proportional to nu to the minus one third. So let me let me maybe say that the, here we are talking about really the Cassis scalars with the uh, general Hamiltonian time independent velocity field. Okay, when I write something like this, I mean that H is time independent. Okay, so this is autonomous. So in which what happens is that f becomes the average uh, over streamlines of f itself. Okay. So and then two is low phase. Uh, requiring full diffusion time, full diffusion time order nu to the minus one. Okay. And uh, okay, so it's a very interesting uh, uh, paper. And uh, some of the things, I think, you know, it's not super precise. It doesn't give a definition of what a homogenization means. But you should think of averaging, right? So how long does it take a passive scalar to average out completely when you mix it with a flow with closed streamlines, OK? And it says there are two stages. One, it's a rapid one, OK? That happens at this time. And, uh, and then there is the second one. So, uh, so I hope it's sort of maybe clear to you how to phrase this in terms of an anticipation and so on uh, uh, at this stage. Uh, let me just try again. So, so what is the average over streamlines for a shear flow? So what are the streamlines? Streamlines, I mean the level sets of H, OK? When uh, you have a shear flow. Right? The, uh, the streamlines are just uh, horizontal lines, right? Let's say that, uh, Tarek was the uh, like sine of y, for example, or something like that, right? So those are the streamlines. So what uh, Ryan and Young tells you is like, OK, what happens is that f becomes 
the average of string lines. What is the average of string lines here? So what is it? So if I fix a streamline at uh, some y, what is the average at the streamlines at level y? Huh? The horizontal average. The x average. So f in some time proportional to is the interpretation for shear flows, right? This is a big O, by the way, a uh, big O. Okay. Some, something becomes that, which is what we've been proving, right? Because all our results uh, for shear flows um, say you have to remove the x average, the k equals 0 mode. And the rest of the solution goes down like that. So what we've been proving, essentially, right, yesterday, is that f minus its x average Decays like e to the minus nu to some power p. And p is less than 1. One third is just for coet, though. OK, so may, I guess maybe at least they weren't thinking of uh, you know, the definition of uh, Henan's distribution that they gave. You see, the fact that you have uh, a p that is not one third, but maybe is one half, like we saw yesterday, because you have critical points. But maybe that's not really the generic uh, behavior, right? Because it's just some point there. And so uh, there is some uniformity in the definition that they gave that uh, it's uh, maybe they didn't have that in mind. But then, of course, if you then look at the x average, but the x average, I mean, just satisfies the heat equation, right? because uh, the transport uh, average is out. So yes, this then will go to 0. But uh, so it will become small at times t like nu to the minus 1, right? So, so we, we sort of uh, done that for, for uh, <coughs> For shear flows, another case in which it can be more or less similarly is when uh, you're radial. Okay, so for circular flows, in which the streamlines are exactly circles, in this case you put yourself say in R2 or in the disk. Okay, I guess the bold. Okay, so this uh, can be done. Uh, I've done this with uh, Michele Dolce, <coughs> and uh, recently with a master student and Michele. Uh, and uh, but uh, these two these two examples are somewhat uh, very special. So the other example that uh, we have in mind is, say, a cellular flow, right, in which the streamlines can be complicated. So for example, uh, I don't know, you would think uh, if you look at sine x sine y, we saw that uh, on, 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 two, on a periodic box, what we have, we have some hyperbolic points, right? Some cells that look like this. OK? I mean, your body points are not there for uh, circular flows, are not uh, there for uh, shear flows, right? So, and then you may have elliptic points, you have these separatrices. So, you can imagine that the understanding mixing is a little bit more complicated, right? So. What can we say in, in a general case, right? That's, uh, but do you see where I'm going? And these, these problems, these uh, Hamiltonian here, or also something like 
sine x plus sine y are super important for Euler and Navier-Stokes. Okay? They are eigenfunctions de Laplace, so they're all stationary solutions. And uh, uh, understanding the dynamics near these flows, it's, uh, it's, it's really open problem. Okay? So, um, <coughs> okay. so what can we say in general for the passive scalar? Let's say, you see also Tarek was really looking at the flow map, right, generated by these, these things, which is essentially looking at passive scalars, right, uh, in, in a sense. Uh, so uh, let's see, how fast can we mix? Okay, so what 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 do do we need to to find? Okay, so this means is the same as saying find a lower bound on gamma of t, right? That's the goal. So what do we need to find? Uh, really? So gamma of t has some uniformity in it, right? It's, uh, it's a universal rate of mixing, meaning all initial data that are not concentrated on streamlines, say, uh, decay like gamma of t in h minus 1, right? So we know that, uh, so here I'm looking at uh, this problem, so general transport equation, we know that the L2 norm is conserved for all times, and we can interpolate L2 between H minus 1 and H1, right? So to find the lower bound of mixing rate, what do we need to find? So the goal is find 1 as 0 in H1, such that uh, f of t in H1 grows at most like something, right? So, and the spoiler is that it will grow at most like t. So, if we have this, right, we find one initial datum that grows at most like t, this will tell me that uh, uh, gamma of t cannot be better than 1 over t. Because, well, then this is t, right? You divide, and uh, you know that datum cannot. Uh, but you see that this is much easier than finding mixing, right? Right. Uh, actually, prove that gamma of t is like one over t to the one over n, right? And notice also that uh, it could be that uh, the growth of h and the decay of h minus 1 don't need to match because this is an interpolation inequality, right? If this was an equality, it would be maybe different. But uh, it's an inequality. So, um, <coughs> so in fact, if you have a shear flow with critical points, we know that the mixing rate is maybe n equal to, say, it's 1 over square root of t. But the growth will be still uh, one uh, will be still t okay for for that data i guarantee is this clear or not growth can be faster than the mixing and shear flows are an example of that yes uh, okay so now, how fast can we enhance dissipate? C 
So here I'm looking, I, I'll decorate with the new, the solution of uh, the viscous problem, OK? Because I have to compare them. Um, so this is, uh, we will prove. OK? But we saw with Tarek also that uh, you know what is the growth of the flow map of a flow of an autonomous flow? Like what can we re can we expect most of the time? You remember? T, right? That's what they told us. So that's this T, okay? Because you just use the characteristics. Of course, you see. The maximum growth of uh, the flow map of the cellular flow, what can it be? I'm pointing at the point here. You have exponential contraction. So w what is then approximation at this point of the flow map? It's like x dot equal minus x and y dot equal y. Right? So you have exponential uh, compression in the x direction, exponential stretching. Okay, but don't put yourself there with your initial datum, right? Put your, support your datum somewhere here. You're trapped between two streamlines, so uh, it's like the, the hyperbolic point didn't exist in this case, right? And that's the growth in t, because I have to find one initial datum, right? I don't have to understand everything. Uh, okay, so how fast can we enhance dissipate? So if we knew that uh, this is the best uh, rate that you can get for Hamiltonian, so let's compare the viscous and the inviscid problem. And by comparing, it's a computation that essentially Tuan did in his uh, boundary layer uh, presentation, right? So. What is this? The Udall Grad term, I take the difference of the two equations and I uh, test in L2. This is just nu, Laplacian of f nu, f nu minus f, which is equal to minus nu gradient of f nu. Maybe let me Cauchy Schwartz here. OK, <clears throat> so I can uh, absorb uh, half of this in here. OK, so say that I start with the same initial datum. I integrate this, uh, this thing. And we get, so if uh, f0 and f0 nu are the same, OK? Uh, <clears throat> f nu at time t minus f of time t in L2 is less than or equal nu times the integral from 0 to t of gradient of f squared in L2. So this estimate uh, seems uh, like a triviality, but it's important because uh, I'm bounding the difference between the two only by the inviscid problem. An inviscid problem is uh, often much easier to uh, analyze because uh, what diffusion does, it blurs everything. It makes, uh, you know, it doesn't keep compass supports. It doesn't do any of that stuff. But here, you know, maybe I can control that, uh, that thing much better. So again, I was saying if you put yourself in sort of a part in which there is only shearing, right, how, how big can this be? If we believe that result, what do we have? We have, well, this is like t squared <coughs> integrated as t cubed. Okay. 
So up to what time are these two problems closed? So when can I make this different small? Well, this is small for times less than, say, right? Delta uh, nu to the one third. Right? So that's going to be our delta cube. Uh, do we agree? Yes? So which are long time, but uh, you know, not as long as diffusion times. OK. So now, f in L2 is conserved. f nu in L2 will decay, right? So but uh, at what time can it start decay? Well, not before that, right? If it starts decaying before that, at a shorter time, then the problems will not be closed right, in L2, because one L2 norm is conserved, and the other one is just going down. So this just tells me that lambda nu cannot be, uh, sorry, is bounded above by nu to the one third. Is it clear the reasoning or not? Please ask a question if it's not. Right? The two problems are closed. Uh, one of them cannot just go down and before you know, they separate. Right? <coughs> so this is, if you want, uh, you know, this nu to the minus 1 third there. That, that's where it comes from, right? However, yesterday when we proved by hypercursivity and so on, uh, nu to the one third. We didn't prove an upper bound on the rate. We proved a lower bound on lambda nu. OK? So we proved that uh, lambda nu is at least uh, nu to the some power, n over n plus 2. Uh, here we're saying that, OK, we're not going to be able to prove better than nu to the one third. Any, any questions so far? Checking the time. <laughs> okay. I have, I have maybe yes, a please. General question. So uh, to get this estimate, to, to estimate this difference between f nu and f, we use essentially that the equation is linear. Am I right? So yeah. I mean, if we if we have active uh, mixing, not passive one, then then there is no hope to prove. Uh, actually, it's uh, exactly the same proof. So it depends what you mean uh, exactly by active mixing. So you think uh, of Euler and Navier-Stokes, right? Uh, but if you think about uh, showing that, say, if you wanted to show how, what's the Nance dissipation rate for linearized Navier-Stokes? Mm -hmm. Then, for example, uh, for Poisson, Uh, 2 dx psi equals nu Laplacian of omega, right? So, so let's say it's 0 for Euler near Poisson, right? So how, how, how fast can this grow in uh, H1, right? That's the first question. Well, we did uh, yesterday some sort of estimate, right? So we saw that uh, the dy of omega or the gradient of omega. So I take a y derivative, but I, I get that term, right? The minus 2 uh, y dx omega dy omega. Yes? Now, if you just do the not so smart thing, of saying, OK, this is less than or equal. Let's say we're in a y is bounded and not in all of r, right? this computation. Less than or equal than the gradient of omega squared, right? That's one. 
then uh, this is what, uh, what is the gro growth that we will tell you. It will tell you exponential growth. OK, that's uh, not great. But in general, if you think, oh, I'm going to have at most exponential growth, which is true for transport equation, what is uh, lambda nu? By this thing, you will have an e to the t here. You will have the log nu that I talked about it. But in this case, you remember that we had that other nice conservation law that involved this. So in fact, y dx omega, dy omega, we have something like that. But this, I can put 0 there. Maybe plus something else, OK? At 0, the velocity. We had to combine those. But now, what is the growth here? What is the growth? It's just t. Because you have a square here, you don't have a square here. Right? So this tells you that uh, gradient of omega grows like t. Okay, And then, uh, well, you have, by the energy equation, you have the energy equation. And that's all, all it uses here, right? Uh, I mean, I'm using anti So also for Poisson, I can prove that lambda nu cannot be more than nu to the one third, but I can. But uh, I said it's uh, the lower bound is nu to the one half, which is uh, uh, smaller, right? So which one is the the sharp one? Uh, we don't know. That's an open question. Okay. Uh, so, but I mean, if you mean active by saying I linearize around. Uh, Navier Stokes, then uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, something that this argument can be applied. Okay. Okay, so any other questions? Yeah? The, In the uh, in anticipation? Uh, OK. Uh, yes and no. And I'll try to explain it now. Uh, but uh, so I can prove by using some sort of stochastic characteristic stuff that uh, all the rates that they should, like the rates nu to the 1 half, for example, is sharp. And that uses something, a datum that is concentrated near the critical point. But away from it, like, right, if when you have dissipation, something will leak into the critical point, for sure. Uh, so uh, the, how fast it does it and uh, how relevant it is, maybe it's not so clear yet. Uh, but uh, you can't really just say, oh, you'll never hit the critical point or something like that, because of uh, diffusion. So uh, yeah. OK. So. Uh, what, what are the ideas uh, in doing this for in general? So you agree with me that uh, we need to prove this mixing rate, this lower bound on the mixing to justify what I just said, OK, at least. So uh, this is uh, some joint work with uh, uh, Elia Bruel. Uh, and Elio Marconi. So from like last year. But there was a previous work uh, by Elio and Paolo Bonicato. I think it's 19. They did it just on R2. Everything works in any manifold uh, uh, with or without boundary. It doesn't matter. <coughs> so. Uh, but so I, I said that the strategy to prove something like that is to show that uh, you have growth at most like t, right? And the idea is that you want to stay away from the troubles. And so you don't want to be close to, uh, you don't want to be close to a hyperbolic point, And you don't want to be close to the elliptic points, OK? So 
this is maybe by picture is uh, is not so hard to see. Uh, in in some cases, in general, the statement is that uh, there exists uh, a constant and uh, an interval. in the range of the Hamiltonian such that omega, which is the pre-image of this interval, is invariant for the flow map which uh, I call X, capital X, okay, not phi. Uh, okay, it's exactly the phi that Tarek was talking about, the characteristics. And the velocity field for every X in omega. Okay. Now, what is the assumption here on H? H is uh, C1 intersection W2 P, uh, W1 P, W2 P. For P, I mean, for this, uh, okay, you don't need P greater than or equal to 1, but because I'll deal with dissipation, let's, let's take P greater than or equal to 1. So, the, the velocity field is continuous and W1P for some P, OK? Um, OK, so let's see if uh, we can prove this, but maybe we can skip this. Uh, so let's skip, let's skip the proof, OK? Think of if you want to do it for the cellular flow, you just have to check that in an annulus, say in one of the cells, the velocity is never zero. But you, you will see. I mean, it's just sines and cosines, right? You can check that. Okay, so it's not, it's not that uh, that that hard. So there is a, uh, of course, h uh, not constant. Okay, that's also an assumption. So how do we, wh what does this uh, tell me? This tells me that essentially I can change within omega. So omega for me, uh, I call it, so omega is, the, is a good invariant set. OK? And I mean, uh, in, the, in the cellular flow, you may think that, uh, OK, you maybe found four, right, four disconnected components of this set. But take one connected component, OK? So uh, uh, it's OK. OK, so, um, so what does this allow me to define? So for me, H. Uh, h is the variable that is in the range of h, OK? And uh, I can define the period of the closed curve at level h. So I pick an h in the cellular flow is somewhere between, uh, I guess, minus 1 and 1. Um, and uh, um, you know, I select one curve that is not uh, so. Uh, so maybe l let me just say, l l keep in mind always the cellular flow. Okay, so if I have my cellular flow, what is uh, the the separatrices here are at what level h equals zero, and the elliptic point is at h equal 1, okay? 
this point here. Think of just one cell, OK? So I pick an H that is uh, between 0 and 1, right? Uh, and, uh, in general, I will want to restrict somewhere between, strictly between 0 and 1. And, uh, so, and I can define the, so the period, I define it T of H is, well, the integral over over the closed curve somewhere in the good domain, right, of uh, one of the, the velocity. OK, that's uh, the period. Uh, and then, uh, so I can define these action angle coordinates. So. I go from, uh, so I, I write them like this, from an angle and an action, that is h, into, say, x, y. So this is an angle, but uh, it's in s1. This is somewhere in h0, h1. OK, so in the good domain. Um, L what is the notation that I use? Just not to. I think it's phi. There is a page two missing in my lecture notes, which I fear <coughs> is exactly. Uh, No, no, OK. Uh, yeah, phi of theta h is the flow map This, you agree that it's a map from S1 cross uh, H0, H1 into, say, the two torus. Uh, this is the period. What is XH? XH satisfies uh, th this uh, OD. where x0 is defined as uh, uh, by h of x0 is equal to h0. OK, so what I'm doing is that I have my level h0. And uh, where does the point uh, x, uh, how does the point x move? It, it moves from some point x0 here, right? It moves orthogonally to the uh, streamlines, right? Because look at, it just depends. The, its velocity is parallel to the gradient. OK, so that's my xh. And the angle, right, measures then uh, how this moves along trajectory. Because x, instead, we saw with Tyrek, it just moves along trajectories, right? The flow, you, you, you are on a streamline, so you stay on the streamline. So for a circular flow, so for, let's say, the rigid rotation, this is exactly the polar coordinates, right? Weirdly enough, if you have a circular flow that is different, <laughs> these are not exactly the polar coordinates. But you should always think in polar coordinates if you are using a circular flow, OK? So what's uh, the good thing about this? So you see that this has to be defined where the velocity is not 0. In that case, in omega, this change of coordinates and its inverse are well defined. They're C1 uh, change of coordinates. Okay, So that's the good thing. Uh, but uh, what happens when I change coordinates in the 
in the equation. Okay, what happens is that this equation, this is in uh, say x, y, what happens when I go to theta h, it's a computation, this becomes 1 over t h d theta f equals 0. Okay? Of course, again, remember, I'm doing this where I can do it, okay? So in the good invariant domain. Uh, these coordinates may not be defined uh, everywhere. Ah, but that's amazing because now if I gave you this equation and I ask you how does the flow map uh, grow? Well, what is the flow map here in the, these coordinates? Well, it will be well, h dot equals 0 and theta dot equals 1 over th, uh, 1 over th. Right? So how do the, the h is constant, so h is equal to h, and theta is t over So those are the cards. If you want, I, put, I can put the okay, H0 if you like. But, uh, OK? It grows linearly, right, in these coordinates. But it will grow linearly also in the original coordinates because the, the change of coordinates is C1, OK? So the, there is no problem with that. So the, the, the gradient uh, of this grows, uh, grows linear. Um, and so. You know, but for this you can, you know, at least uh, for any datum that is concentrated, so whose support is in omega, what's the mixing rate here? Maybe you can't deduce in for, from this. This you can deduce the growth. But with this, okay, take a Fourier transform in theta. Theta is periodic, right? Do a stationary phase, just like before. All you need is some properties of t prime, right? Which is exactly what uh, will enter in the stationary phase argument again. Okay? So the derivative of 1 over t of h, but in the end, uh, it will be. So this tells us that if f0 is supported, in omega, then the gradient of F0 in LT will grow like T, I'll say gradient, sorry, gradient of F of T, let's say in an infinity. So this is by characteristics. Let you just compose the solution with the characteristics the character and with the flow map. Flow map grows linearly, so that one grows linearly as well. Nicola, yes? Don't you have an assumption on non-zero corners or something like that? This is just a rigid rotation. Uh, <coughs> right. Uh, so uh, where does that? Uh, no, no, no. You're right. Uh, where does that uh, come into? Uh, yeah, yeah, but they won't be able. Uh, yeah, I, gu I guess so. Yeah, uh, actually, sure. It may not grow. Yes, 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 yes. yes. No, I was just thinking whether uh, we we rule it out, but. Of course, if you w really wanted to prove uh, mixing, uh, then uh, it's a problem, right? Uh, so, right, 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 right. Uh, yes, yeah, so that will enter in, uh, in this. But uh, so l l let me just say that uh, we don't really prove mixing in general. We prove mixing for the cellular flow, which is definitely not uh, isochronal. Uh, the, the, the only thing is that if you want to prove now a global mixing estimate for all H1 data 
such that uh, they're not, uh, they're, they have zero average on streamlines, right? Uh, uh, then you have to deal with the fact that you may have degeneracies of everything when you say from uh, your good invariant domain, you let h goes to 1 or goes to 0, right? So you may have degeneracies. And uh, now we will compute what those degeneracies are in the case of the serial flow. Okay? But um, so let's see. I think we have uh, enough time to do two things, actually. Um, so how can we? So I, I hope we agree that now we prove that uh, gamma of t is at most 1 over t, and lambda nu is nu to the 1 term. So these exponents that Reins and Yang were talking about uh, come up uh, maybe in this way. So what's the question that uh, maybe you, you would want to ask is that, OK, why uh, you showed us yesterday, you drove us crazy with all this hypercursivity stuff. Uh, why don't you just do hypercursivity with this stuff, right? Change coordinates. It looks like a shear flow. So the problem is that now you would want to change coordinates in the Laplacian, new Laplacian, right? Instead of from x and y, you put yourself in h theta. The Laplacian doesn't uh, deal well with uh, non-radial stuff, right? So either you're a circular flow, then you know what the Laplacian in radial coordinates, uh, in polar coordinates is, and you have this decoupling, so you don't have explicit coefficients in theta in the Laplacian. But if you just do ellipsis, for example, you will have functions of theta depending on the ellipticity, right? So you won't be able to really write down a nice problem in, uh, in the diffusive case. That's one way to see it. The other way to see it is that you remember we are taking in shear flows k equals 0, we're removing that. So we're removing the average of streamlines. So does the average over streamlines commute with the Laplacian? It definitely commutes with the transport. That's no question about it. But does it commute? You can see it from here. The, theta equal, the k equals 0 in theta, you can take it here. There's no problem. But k, does it commute with the Laplacian? It, it does not in general, right? It does in shear flows and, cellular, and uh, radial flows. That's why those two are two res, the two results that we know about when we talk about enhanced dissipation and, and sharp rates, OK? So. Uh, So I'm just hinting at all the open problems in the in, in, if you want. Uh, OK, so let's do two things. One is, up to now, I, have, I stayed away uh, from critical point, I mean, from elliptic points and, uh, um, and hyperbolic points. So let me just uh, say what happens near elliptic points. Assume for simplicity, assume that uh, you have 0, 0 is elliptic. So for the, uh, okay, for the cellular flow, you have to translate by pi over 2 somewhere. But uh, so what, what is uh, the thing that they want to do? I really want to, so I have my elliptic point here. Near it uh, is elliptic and near it. Which means that uh, the Hessian uh, is positive definite at uh, 0, 0 is positive. OK, so it's kind of like the simple critical points case, OK, in this case. Uh, second derivative non-zero. So I have my elliptic point here. So around it, I have something that they don't have to be circled, but uh, they kind of look like circles. And 
uh, let's take, so this is my point zero, zero. And I look. OK. So now I can just write uh, t as a function of r. I just don't call it different, but t of r means t of h of the point r0. OK? I just uh, essentially reparameterizing my Hamiltonian there, uh, in a sense. And uh, so this is just to state uh, the theorem is that assume that t prime of r is like r to some power beta for beta greater than or equal to 0 um, as r goes to 0. Okay. Then gamma of t is bounded below by this. And uh, lambda nu is bounded above by this. OK? So this is an improvement for beta greater than 1. OK? For beta equal to 0, the argument that we have may be not very good, because we saw that uh, actually, yeah. yes? Uh, so to get the uh, action angle, I may have to. If it is smooth, you cannot have that. Huh? If it is smooth, you cannot have this beta. Uh, then the period is uh, smooth. Yeah, yeah, but this, uh, for example, for the cellular flow, it's uh, beta equal one. Uh, because now I'm, I, I, this is not uh, h, right? So it's uh, r. So. For the cellular, I, I show the computation, but uh, you, you can have the, we have an example. So yes, 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 yes. Uh, but uh, it's because it's H is not R. In, uh, sorry, it's R, not H anymore. Yeah. Uh, because if, uh, if H is a smooth uh, function in two dimension, if you have a non-degenerate minimum, you can change the coordinates by preserving the symplectic form. So that h is a function of x squared plus y squared. Yes. So yes. you can compute. Yes, 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 yes. yes. But so, yes, exactly. But that's uh, exactly because I'm looking at now the really the distance uh, r rather than the level set h. So that's uh, it's going to be t prime is going to be uh, one in h. But uh, it's quadratic in R, or, so, or something like that. So that's, uh, that's uh, the subject here. Yeah. But good catch, very good catch. Um, so this is an improvement for beta greater than 1, and this is an improvement for beta greater than 0, OK, uh, if you like. So impro by improvement, it means right, if beta is big, right, this I'm telling you, you can mix uh, at most like 1 over t to some power, you know, smaller than 1. And so it, uh, it restricts uh, even more how fast you can mix, uh, if you like. Same for enhanced dissipation, right? As the bigger the beta, the slower, uh, the, the tighter the bound is. So right? you, you, you don't ask something like uh, scale. I mean, the fact that you have some uh, notation is dependent really on the yeah, so if you're not, yeah, if you're not degenerate, it's like there is a rigid rotation hidden there, so nothing is degenerate. Yeah, in a sense, yeah. But I'm also very ignorant about KM, so uh, maybe I didn't catch uh, at all the. 
<coughs> okay, so uh, so this uh, well, uh, it's uh, just uh, when you compute the gradient of the flow map in uh, in uh, coordinates, uh, you have to be careful. I keep in track of the dependence on. Uh, on t prime. So the estimate uh, is something like this. So the gradient of the flow map point is less than or equal 1 plus constant uh, r t prime of r t over t r. So this is something you can prove. This is for every x in On the on this line, okay. So that's that's what I'm saying. So if I fix myself on this line, uh, that's the estimate. So let, let's just see how how we do. For example, the Nance dissipation. Okay, it's uh, it's again uh, just some optimization argument. But uh, <coughs> you see, uh, remember that uh, the Nance dissipation is controlled by the growth of the gradient of the inviscid problem, right? So let's take, uh, uh, so basically what I'm going to do, I'm going to take an F0, which is supported in an annulus So, sorry, uh, it's supported. In an annulus, uh, uh, a is greater than 1, not to 0, sorry. So I'm just looking at an annulus uh, here, a distance more or less r. And I want it also to be included in an invariant set, OK? So r is small. a depends on the Hamiltonian. So I want this to be included, say, in a, uh, in a sorry, uh, just in an invariant set. So between two streamlines, right? So if I have, uh, and this just depends on the, the A, you know, I may have to move just a little bit from R to be included in an invariant set and in an annulus, OK? But uh, I will be able uh, to do that. And so I take, uh, basically, I would like to take the indicator function of that guy. But uh, OK, it has to be smoothed out a little bit. Because then I want to compute the gradient of Ft in H1, sorry, the, in L2. And uh, this will be uh, less than or equal by, again, combining characteristics. And the, uh, sorry, I want to do this, this. This gradient of x, okay. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. This is just pointwise. Uh, so. so the gradient of uh, the function at x and t. Uh, what am I saying here? Uh, gradient. Just a second. Uh, so of course I want to use that. Uh, I integrate in time. I think that's what I want to do. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, yes. OK, I integrate in time this thing squared. And uh, this will be uh, less than or equal. So what do I have here? So how big is gradient of f0 in L infinity squared? So I'm uh, in a band of uh, you know around r. A is small, r is small. So, and this is like an indicator function kind of thing. So this will be like uh, the gradient will be like one over r. Okay, this I think should be L two though, right? Uh, this can be L two. So it's one over r squared, uh, and here I have, uh, so if I integrate, I get t over r squared from the first term here. And then I have r to the 1 plus beta squared. So r to the bet 2 beta. t cubed. Okay, that's the estimate that I would get. I canceled out this r squared with the one over r squared coming from the. And now I optimize again, and if you optimize, uh, you get the growth. So what is the optim opt optimization there? If I optimize that, I want to set t over r squared equals r to the 2 beta t cubed. So r to the uh, 1 plus beta is equal to 1 over t. So r is 1 over t to the 1 over 1 plus beta. And I plug it back in, say here. And so I get uh, that, uh, that estimate. So let me just continue from here. Is uh, uh, t so to the 3 plus beta over 1 plus beta. OK? No, it's not. It's not. That's why you get this 1 over r squared. Because it's just like a okay, constant. So it's a, it's a familiar function? No, it's just something supported in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, annulus here. Okay, For so the, a, small, a, the small r is fixed. Yeah, the small r is fixed. OK, so why do you try to optimize t? Well, I optimize. So this is true for any r, okay. right? So I just pick an r so that is. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So you see now that the, if I have to put a new here to control the dissipation, and uh, the relation between nu and t is exactly this guy here. OK? So that's how you get uh, this upper bound on the Nance nice dissipation rate. Um, OK. So just to say for the cellular flow, it took me way longer than I thought to do this argument. But uh, for the cellular flow, uh, you can compute the period uh, exactly. So H is, so for the, for the cellular flow, what is beta for the cellular, cellular flow? That's maybe the question. So t of r, right, is, so I have to compute t prime. Because that's my, my. Is pi over two, pi over two, or? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, the maximum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
pi over 2 pi over 2. So t prime is, well, the, is t of h of r0 prime, right? That's uh, how I define t in terms of r. So then is like t prime of h. And then, uh, well, the gradient of h there, the gradient of h, I mean, h is quadratic near the elliptic uh, point, right? h is quadratic, so it's like r square, so I have r here. And this is just r. So t prime of h is like 1 near the elliptic point. Why? Because I can compute it exactly. Okay? So T of H in the case of So you, you see I, I gave you this formula that is one over velocity on the streamlines, right? That's not very useful unless you can parameterize the curve and uh, compute it uh, precisely, right? Um, so you can do it for the cellular flow, it's just an exercise in parameterizing uh, the curve. Okay. It's, it's not that bad. So uh, let me just write down the right expression for once so that. Um, so it is four times integral from h to 1 of 1 over square root of x squared minus h squared times 1 over 1 minus x squared dx. OK? It's some formula like that. Uh, this is uh, called uh, incomplete, incomplete uh, elliptic integral of first kind. whatever that is. But there are a lot of people that just studied everything about this integrals. And in particular, you know that t of h is like, uh, sorry. So you, you have the precise constants of this asymptotic. I, I, I'm just saying that this is really a bound. OK? Uh, it's a global bound. It just degenerates when h uh, goes to 0, OK? So at, and uh, t prime of h is like 1 over h. t second of h is like 1 over h squared. You also have. Uh, well, t prime is actually negative, and you have a lower bound as well. Okay, so minus t prime of h is really one over h. So, okay, you you do have the constants, okay, if you want them, but uh, they're they're not very useful. Well, what I'm saying is that that all is all you need to compute uh, uh, to do the stationary phase argument. Some uh, of this stuff will come up. You see, the fact that you have a log here is not just about the cellular flow. It's the fact that you have this exponential stretching and compressing. And uh, you can prove that for any Hamiltonian with a finite number of critical uh, of hyperbolic points. Okay? It has to go like that, if you are a regular Hamiltonian. And, uh, and uh, similarly for this. But this is a nice formula that you can just uh, prove. OK, and, uh, and fine, I, I, I hadn't seen it before, but I was told that it's typical that periods are computed in terms of elliptic integrals. Uh, so is, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. So uh, this will tell you, if you do the stationary phase argument, and then I, I, I'll stop here, is that gamma of t, you know, we know that is at most 1 over t because we know that there are some data for which you just have shearing. Uh, and then, uh, but you can prove uh, that you have like uh, just a little bit and one over t to the one third. Okay, so in a sense, this is sort of 
the first uh, example that uh, we found that you can actually prove some mixing rate that is global. Okay, I'm not requiring anything about the initial datum besides being in H1. Okay, that uh, and having zero average on the streamlines, um, for which you can actually prove an upper bound. And the fact that it's one third, uh, weirdly enough, comes from near the critical point. Sorry, the hyperbolic point. Okay. So near the elliptic point, the mixing is like 1 over t still. But uh, near the hyperbolic point, uh, as we saw in many cases, you know, you'd think that you have great uh, things happening because you have a compression, exponential compression, exponential stretching. But you need to be able to control stuff. Like, you know, Toan had to the stability of instabilities and stuff like that, right? And the, the philosophy is similar. I mean, uh, at some point, you just lose control of everything. Maybe the action angle coordinates are not really the good ones near a hyperbolic point, because they just have a t growth instead of exponential growth. So there is a lot of uh, open uh, questions in, uh, in, this, uh, in this business, I think. And, but uh, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to, to tell you more about this if you, if you want. So, but thank you very much for. Uh,